Good evening. Good evening. And welcome all to United Church on this holy night in the Christian year. We reference it as Monday Thursday, the night of the Christian year when we remember the love that Christ has for each one of us, a love that we share with our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and many, many more beyond these walls. I am deeply grateful to be here with you tonight, and as I look out, I see that there are numerous visitors perhaps here from Marco Island uh, during the Easter week, some visiting uh, friends and family. I want you to know that you are welcome in this place, and it is with the love of God that I greet you and include you in tonight's worship service. Before we begin our time of worship together, just a couple of announcements about happenings in the life of the church. You'll note, of course, that this coming Sunday morning, we are going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ here at United Church Easter Sunday. Two worship services at 8.15 and at 10 o'clock. And all, of course, are welcome and invited to attend. And I hope that you'll invite your friends and family as we have some powerful music uh, planned this coming Sunday at 8.15 and 10 o'clock. One of United Church's long-standing traditions on Easter is to collect an offering for an organization that's in need. And this year, we've been collecting our Easter offering to benefit Sanibel United Church of Christ that endured some uh, very serious challenges following Hurricane Ian. And many thanks to all in the congregation who have already made a gift toward this offering. And if you'd like to do so tonight, there's some baskets at the back of the sanctuary. And you can make a gift in one of those baskets. And it will surely bless another church that's in need at this particular time in the church's life. We prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
It often gets said that the empty tomb is that much more powerful when we as followers of Christ stop to remember Christ's sacrifice. And we do that tonight in remembering the love that Christ had for his disciples and for all the world. Maundy Thursday, that word Maundy comes from a Latin word, mandatum novum, meaning the love command. Namely, that we've been asked by God in Christ to love one another as God loves us. And tonight, we celebrate God's love focused on three different images. We begin with the image of Christ washing the disciples' feet. Then we move to Christ serving the Lord's Supper to his disciples. And finally, we conclude the service with the cross. All three images reflect a love that is selfless, a love that is unconditional, a love that empties on behalf of a God who truly cares about each one of us. We begin our worship service with some singing, remembering the love of God, an opening hymn, Blessed Assurance, number 426. We stand and sing together. We unite our hearts and voices together in a call to worship printed in our bulletins. Jesus came as God wrapped in flesh to dwell among us. The Spirit of God was upon him to bring freedom to the captive and healing to the sick. He told the truth and was rejected for it. He was arrested, tried, and crucified. He 
He was forsaken and died for our freedom. He is the spotless Lamb of God. We continue to reflect on the cross and on Christ's love by standing and singing hymn number 283, Were You There? The question often gets asked, who was it who was responsible for the death of Christ? Was it Judas? Was it the Jewish ruling authorities? Was it Rome and those Roman soldiers? Yes, 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 and it was also all of us. All of us who sin and fall short of God's glory are in part responsible for the death of Christ, for we have fallen short as humans created by God. Therefore, we feel a compelling need to confess our sin. We join our hearts and voices together in a unison prayer of confession printed in our bulletins. Most merciful God, we confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ, where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him. Forgive us, we pray, and by your Spirit make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, we give you thanks for the witness of Christ tonight and for the love that Christ embodied. For while considering the future of his life that would be just a few more hours in length, while considering a future that was dark and painful, 
Christ made time amidst it all to serve and to love. For Christ's heart that is spilled out for his disciples, we are deeply grateful. For it is that same love, O oh God, that you spill out on each one of us. For many of us gathered here this evening have our own fears about life, about our health, about our future, about loved ones. And amidst those fears, you meet us and you enable us, yes, to love even still. May you give us the courage, O oh God, to love others as you love us, without condition, simply for being, selfless, merciful, and compassionate. We pause for a moment this evening and we share back our prayer requests with you. For we remember tonight that you are not a God who is aloof, but rather you are a God who washes feet. And in wanting to touch us, in wanting to be present for us, you hear our personal prayers. Receive them now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. These prayers we pray in and through the Spirit of Christ Jesus, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This evening's Monday Thursday reading is John 13, verses 1 through 17. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basement and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truth, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you to all of the musicians for your glorious music this evening. Let us pray. Wise and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you tonight and always. Amen. Some months ago, at a Little League Baseball board meeting, we got presented a scenario involving an umpire, two different parents, two different coaches, and three players. And after the backstory of the scenario was described to the entire board, one of my fellow board members leaned back in his chair and said, I don't think we should touch this one with a 10-foot pole. You ever use that phrase in your own vernacular when it comes to something you would never want to get involved in or it's just too messy, you want to avoid it? I wouldn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. You know, the internet is a little bit divided about the history of where that phrase actually came from. But believe it or not, some believe it actually has religious roots. For back in the 1700s at St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 in New Orleans, those who were in charge of preparing the above-ground cemeteries of the Spanish Catholic Church 
were often tasked with having to take bodies after they had been in, uh, in an above-ground tomb for almost a year and move those bodies, lower them in order to put more bodies into the tomb. And because of the decomposing smell of the bodies and the New Orleans heat, they would use 10-foot poles in order to do that work. In other words, we wouldn't want to touch this mess, this, this, this uh, ugly body, dead body with a 10-foot pole. We wouldn't want to touch whatever it is with a 10-foot pole. And I do wonder, not to psychologize this text, if Jesus in all of his humanity, when he bent down to wash his disciples' feet, perhaps mumbled that phrase underneath his breath. I don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Not that Jesus was squeamish per se about the literal dirt that was on the disciples' feet in John chapter 13, but, you know, the metaphorical dirt that he's touching in this particular scripture passage, uh, the hurt of the disciples, the sin of the disciples, the humanity of the disciples, the filth of their lives, uh, the struggle of who they are. Jesus is willing in this moment to touch it. But I do wonder if he ever hesitated. I mean, Peter tried to get him not to do it. That was Peter's convincing of Jesus, was it not, in this text? Peter tried to convince him not to. Jesus, I don't believe you should touch this with a 10-foot pole. I mean, Jesus, you are the Son of God. I should be washing your feet. You shouldn't be washing my feet. But yet, but yet Jesus decides that he will wash Peter's feet, that he will watch the disciples' feet. Friends, one of the most important lessons that I learn about Jesus' washing of feet in John's gospel is simply this. Jesus is willing to put 10 fingers on those challenges, hurts, and sins in our life that we wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. It sounds almost irreverent, does it not, to think about Jesus' 10 fingers on those things in our personal lives and in the life of the world that we wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole? It sounds almost irreverent to think about Jesus stooping down to scrub the disciples' feet, not just literally the dirt, but all of the sin and hurt of their lives. It's almost a struggle for us to talk about in all of its, its irreverence. And, and our temptation is to pull a Peter and just try to sanitize it and say, Jesus, why would you want to do this? I remember many moons ago, I was leading a youth group of middle schoolers, and there were some 7th and 8th graders, and I had them uh, one evening do foot washing, and one of the young men in the youth group, his mom packed him with some hand sanitizer. He had a lot of best friends that night. Or there's a story of a Baptist preacher in Macon, Georgia. He really wanted to do foot washing on Monday, Thursday, but his board didn't let him. And so the preacher wanted to do it. The board didn't want to do it. And so they compromised. And he said, okay, we're going to do some shoe shining instead. And so the congregation shined shoes. But afterwards, he said, you know, it really didn't have the impact that I thought it might because shoe signing, shining is something that you can get done in the Atlanta airport. I mean, really and truly, it seems almost irreverent to think about Jesus wanting to stoop down and wash the disciples' feet and get all that sin and all that muck and all that hurt uh, on his very own hands. And that is my own temptation when I read this text, to sanitize it or to somehow a compromise when it comes to my Lord and Savior washing Peter's feet, washing the disciples' feet, washing my feet. Because often when I imagine Jesus, I imagine him clean and in a velvet robe and walking through golden wheat fields of a hallmark landscape and, and, and beside uh, snow-capped mountains every now and again stopping with a presidential wave to, to say hello. Sometimes that's how I imagine Jesus. But on a night like tonight, I'm reminded that Jesus and Jesus' love is so much better than that dirtier. For my sense is that the power of Jesus washing feet is a power of love that says, I am willing to love you to the extent 
that I will go to the dirtiest and darkest places of your life and of the life of your world, and I will be willing to put all ten of my fingers inside of those places. I will touch with my ten fingers what nobody else wants to touch with a ten-foot pole. It's an Episcopal priest by the name of Fleming Rutledge, and she puts it this way in a book. She says, when you think about all of the Christian rites over the centuries and all of the Christian symbols over the centuries, foot washing is the only Christian rite or symbol that we have not been able to make beautiful. Even the cross, says uh, Rutledge, we've been able to sanitize and make it in gold and wear it around our necks. But foot washing, we don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. And therein lies the beauty of all of it, the dirt of ways, the dirt in all of it, the way in which Jesus is willing to invade really, really hard and tough problems in our own lives and the sin and hurt and pain of humanity. It is because of this text that I can say that Jesus will touch with ten fingers that messy or complicated situation in your own life that you don't even want to touch with a ten-foot pole. It's because of this text that I can say that Jesus will touch with ten fingers of the sin and shortcoming of each one of our lives and will say, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I will touch it, even if you don't even want to touch it with a ten-foot pole. It's the same truth that we might say about our world. There are situations in our world that we say, we wouldn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole, and we may not even want Jesus to touch it, but Jesus will. Some of the hardest places of our world, like a hallway in a school in Nashville, Jesus is willing to touch it with all 10 fingers. Rubble in Ukraine, Jesus is willing to touch it with all 10 fingers. The hurt of American politics, Jesus is willing to touch it with all ten fingers. The deepest, darkest corners of chemotherapy units, MD Anderson, Moffitt, Mayo, Jesus is willing to go into those places and touch each one of those people with ten fingers. Why? Because Jesus' love is just that dirty. Jesus is willing to put ten fingers inside of those places in our world that we wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. There was a great Catholic saint by the name of Athanasius who once made this remark about Monday Thursday. He said, that which Christ does not assume in washing the disciples' feet, he does not redeem. In other words, if Christ does not take on all of the filth, all of the dirt, all of the hurt, all of the sin of humanity and of the world onto his hands, he cannot redeem it all. But tonight, Jesus does. He gets all of that on all ten fingers. And tomorrow, he will walk to that cross with those ten fingers, and those ten fingers will be nailed to the cross. And on Sunday, all of the filth, all of the dirt, even those places in our own lives and in the life of the world that we would not want to touch with a ten-foot pole, all of it will be redeemed. If you came to worship this evening looking for an Atlanta airport shoeshiner God, you're not going to find that God here. For the God we have come to worship tonight is better than that, dirtier. I mean, how grungy this all is, and yet, how beautiful.
Hear now these words of remembrance. On the night in which he was betrayed, tonight, Monday, Thursday, Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And on that same night after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, poured out into this cup is the blood of my new covenant. It's been poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Every time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, upon these gifts of bread and wine. By your mysterious power, make them be for us once more your body and blood, so that by partaking in this holy mystery, we might know your love for us, and we might have the courage to love others in the same way you love us. We thank you for your love, O oh God, to the extent that it will invade not just the surface areas of our lives, but our darkness, our grief, our hurt, our sin, and our pain. For touching us this night, we are grateful. Amen. In just a few moments, I'll invite United Church's deacons to come forward to assist me in serving Holy Communion. But before they do, just a couple of words about logistics. Here at United Church, we have the word all in our mission statement. We believe that this table is for all people. And so if you're visiting tonight, I hope you'll feel uh, encouraged to uh, partake in the sacrament alongside uh, all of us at United Church. And you'll note that we will receive Holy Communion by coming forward uh, from the front uh, to the back. You'll receive a wafer, and then you will um, uh, drink a cup of grape juice, and you're asked to uh, place the cup in the trash cans provided at either side of the table, and then return to your seat on the outer edges of the pew. Come now and eat.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us once more at this table. For on the night in which you were betrayed, you, O oh God, continued to serve, continued to love, despite the sin, hurt, and pain of your people. We ask that you would continue to love us tonight, tomorrow, and into Easter Sunday in a way that truly will touch the places of our lives that are dark. Our grief, our sin, our hurt, our fear. You, O oh God, touch them all. May you draw yourself ever near through the power of your Holy Spirit as we walk with Christ in these next few days, trusting in the sure and certain hope of resurrection. Amen. In just a few moments, we'll join our hearts and voices together in a responsive reading that's printed in our bulletins, followed by a benediction. And it has been a liturgical tradition in both the Protestant and the Catholic Church over the centuries for Monday Thursday worship to end in silence. And so as we arrive in the narthex, feel free to meet and greet and chat with your friends. But following the benediction, we will all exit uh, the sanctuary uh, in silence as we reflect upon the magnificent love that is Christ Jesus in our lives. Please stand for a responsive reading. The sounds of the betrayal haunt us. We hear the door as it closes. We hear the jingle of the coins in the purse. We hear the angry cries. We hear the shuffle of feet as you are led away. Soon we will hear the sound of a hammer against nails. If you'll receive this benediction, as you go from this place, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we all meet again, may the Lord Jesus hold you in the palm of his hands. Amen. Go in peace.